Shall we make a start? Uh, I'm Richard Garside. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies, and it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, David Nutt and Alex Stevens uh, for this really interesting discussion and to, um, to chair the, uh, the discussion following. Uh, so just a few quick introductory remarks. Uh, first of all, welcome everyone. Thank you for, for coming along. Um, we held a, an event about 10 years ago called an audience with David Nutt uh, uh, when David was initially uh, had been dismissed from his role as chair of the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs. And it's nice to see a number of faces uh, from that. I recognise a number of people who were there 10 years ago. So welcome back. And um, it's also great to see lots of new faces as well. Uh, the, the debate about drugs is, is definitely not over. Indeed, in many ways, it's only just beginning. So uh, we, we need more and more people to be involved in these discussions. Uh, we organised the event 10 years ago uh, following David's dismissal. And the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies had a kind of a particular role in that because it was really our fault that David got dismissed at all. Um, <laughs> wasn't, that wasn't the plan, but we invited him to give a, a lecture in, in 2009. Then we published the lecture as a report, um, and the report was called Estimating Drug Harms, a Risky Business. And it certainly proved a risky business to, to, to publish that. Uh, but we felt it was really important, um, following um, the dismissal, to, to stand with David and seek to um, get something positive coming out of what was at the time a kind of very distressing and difficult situation. And from that, and it was partly because of David's sheer energy and determination not to go away quietly, uh, a new organisation was born, Drug Science, which is, is still going now, and indeed is going from strength to strength. And we're really proud of our role in helping to set up Drug Science, and it's great to see it flourish as an organisation. Uh, so earlier this year, I approached David and I said, well, you know, we're coming up for this 10-year anniversary. Maybe we should have an event. And um, I was delighted when David agreed that that was a good idea. And I was delighted that um, we could do this with drug science as well. So I think it's going to be a really fascinating event. Uh, we'll hopefully have some time for some Q&A at the end of, of, of David and Alex's um, contributions. Uh, and then we can all repair uh, for the reception um, following. And we'll give you more direction and information about that um, at the end. Uh, before I hand over to David, though, just a couple of quick housekeeping remarks. There's no fire drills planned, so if alarms do go off, and I guess it will be pretty obvious to us what an alarm is, uh, then we should leave in an orderly manner, and I'm sure that uh, we will be told uh, where we should be going, but let's work on the basis that's not going to happen. If you um, want access to the Wi-Fi, uh, there is a, you should be connecting to something called the cloud. Um, and then you launch your browser and then just follow the instructions. And I think it's probably very similar to when you log in on, on trains and in other public places. So maybe don't do your banking, but probably you're safe to do tweeting. And when we're talking about tweeting, if you want to tweet, we are recommending the hashtag, hashtag David Nutt, sorry, David Nutt on drugs. <laughs> yeah, which seemed very appropriate and easy to remember. So David Nutt on drugs. Um, so the format's going to be, David's going to speak for around 45 minutes, we think, maybe, and he's got loads of slides to go through and lots of interesting content. Um, and then Alex Stevens, who recently had resigned from the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, um, concerned about attacks on its independence, will then be speaking, just reflecting partly on what David has to say and on the sort of the broader question about the politics and science of drugs for about ten, five or ten minutes, uh, and then we'll open it to Q&A. So, without further ado, I'll hand you over to David. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> well, it is definitely a sense of déjà vu, and um, <laughs> let's hope the uh, outcome isn't quite as bad as uh, last time. It's the title of my talk, uh, Groundhog Decade, or Brave New World, not Brave New World, and... Uh, I'm going to essentially tell you how, over the last decade, UK policy on drugs has done uh, uh, nothing other than go backwards. Uh, and we're probably in a worse position now than we were 10 years ago. Uh, and at the end, I will show you the path to the brave new world, in the same way as Boris is going to take us to the brave new country. <laughs> so here you have the, uh, the image of my sacking. Um, that's Alan Johnson's hand uh, over my mouth. Uh, the reason I was sacked is still a bit unclear, but uh, I suspect it's really summed up rather well by the, um, the cartoon showing the scales of justice in that bottom left-hand corner there. 
you see that beer and fags lie heavier uh, than those strange green chemicals and pills in the plastic bags. Uh, you also see the book of cannabis falling from my hand. And uh, oh, At the time, I was saying that uh, the evidence we had then was that uh, certainly cannabis was less harmful than alcohol and tobacco, and the hysteria which at that time was being generated around drugs like methadone, and which have continued to be generated around other drugs, uh, new psychoactive substances, uh, is uh, to some extent, perhaps to a large extent, a smokescreen uh, that governments use to pretend they're doing something about drugs, but it's a ploy to avoid confronting the, the big killers in our society today, which are still tobacco and alcohol. So anyway, I was removed from my uh, position as the chief advisor for uh, stepping out of line in terms of drug policy. Uh, and what was remarkable, the very same week, you can see the top left-hand uh, image there, the very same week, Andre Agassi's biography was released. Now, he's a tennis player, for those of you who are too young to know that. <laughs> and um, but he sold his biography, not on the fact that he'd been a Wimbledon champion and he'd sort of fought his way up from the back streets of Las Vegas. He sold his autobiography on the grounds that he'd taken crystal meth and got away with it. Just bear that in mind as we go through. He's not the only one that you know of who's done that. And of course, it makes me wonder, what's going to happen this time? Now, you know, will I be sent to the tower as opposed to <laughs> being dismissed? I don't know. A friend of mine sent me this image saying, be careful, David. Um, you know, <laughs> they kind of sometimes don't like... <laughs> OK, well... The psychologists here, and I've got, I can see a few very expert ones in the audience, know that the way you cope with stress is active resistance. You fight back. And uh, that's what I did. And I fought back by creating a charity called Drug Science. And uh, I was able to do that because uh, of a very generous donation from a man called Toby Jackson. And uh, wonderfully, he's in the audience here. Toby, put your hands up. I want you to give him a round of applause, please. <laughs> And Richard and the team at uh, uh, Centre for Crime and Justice Studies, they nobly got, tried to get me out of the mess they dropped me in. And I want to thank them, Will McMahon, who's not here, and Sophie Mackin, who is. So we started up the charity Drug Science, and it's been really rather successful. And, it, and you'll see through the talk, you'll see, I'm going to compare what Drug Science has done over the last decade, which has been a lot of good things, to what the government has done, which has been a lot of bad things. So what have we done is drug science. Well, we've done a number of analyses called multi-criteria decision analyses, uh, which have changed uh, people's attitude to drugs. We've set up a website which has blogs on current issues, updated very regularly. We produce policy documents. I think we can say we almost forced the WHO to review their belief that cannabis wasn't a medicine because we produced a review that showed it was, that they had to take in account of. We've recently, our recent review on the nature of addiction to amphetamines has changed the sentencing policies in New Zealand uh, so that now it's not compulsory to go to prison if you're caught with methamphetamine in your possession, if you can show that you are either an addict or you have mental health problems. So we've had a huge influence on the international stage. We set up a journal, the Journal of Drug Science Policy and Law, which uh, is a free journal, a web-based journal, and it's getting a lot of citations and uh, altimetric scores. We've set up educational slide sets, and we've now got some podcasts, which some of you may have listened to. So we've been extremely active. Uh, this is the website, for those of you who haven't visited it. Uh, it's uh, recently been refurbished, and uh, you, I, I would suggest that you, at the very least, follow Drug Science on Twitter to find out what we're doing and, uh, and keep abreast of uh, our thoughts and uh, ideas. But this is, uh, I suppose, the, the first and perhaps the most powerful output of the charity. It's a ranking of 20 drugs, some legal, some illegal, using this multi-criteria decision analysis. And uh, the reason we're able to do that is because we had someone that knew what MCDA meant. 
And that's him there. There's Larry. Larry Phillips from the LSE. He approached me in about 2008 saying, what you're doing, Nut, and that was when I was in the ACMD, what you're doing is quite good, but we, you could do it a lot better if you knew the science of decision a, a, a analysis. So we worked with him to create the most detailed, uh, transparent, objective measures of drug harms that have ever, has existed and still exists today. We convened an expert group of uh, over 20 people to look at all the harms that drugs could produce. And then we got thousands of harms, and we were able to uh, break them down into 16 separate variables. Nine are the harms that drugs do to the user, and seven are the harms that drugs do to society. And then we ranked all those 20 drugs on these 16 variables, and then we weighted them. And in the end, we produced this graph, which uh, it's now become almost a meme for uh, drug harms. And it shows that the left-hand side that alcohol is the most harmful drug in the UK at the time we did this analysis, which was nearly 10 years ago. And I don't believe its position has changed since then. It may have got worse. And the reason alcohol is the most harmful drug is because of the size of the red bar. The red bar is a measure of the harm that alcohol does to society. And I can't imagine there's probably no family of anyone in this room that hasn't been negatively affected by alcohol. Alcohol is not the most harmful drug to the user. The blue bars, the size of the blue bars, give you relative harms to users. And you can see to the right of alcohol, you can see heroin, crack cocaine, crystal meth. The blue bars are bigger than the alcohol bars. They're more harmful to the user, but they're used much less. And that's why alcohol is number one. But you'll also see on the right-hand side, drugs like LSD, magic mushrooms, have virtually no harms to society and very little or much less harms to the user. And this ranking, uh, as I say, has become enormously cited, over 1,200, 1,300 citations, Larry tells me now. Uh, it's been reproduced in many different forms. Uh, it tells us that if we want to reduce the harms of drugs, we should be focusing on drugs like alcohol, heroin, and crack. But it also tells us something else. It tells us that there is no relationship between the harms of drugs and their classification under either the UK Misuse of Drugs Act or the United Nations Conventions. There is no correlation. And that tells us something very important. It tells us that those conventions and our drug laws are not evidence-based. They're not based on harm, they're based on something else. They're actually largely based on morality and politics. I think that means that they're legal. I believe the Misuse of Drugs Act actually is failing in its legal duty. What drives this dishonesty? Well, that is actually a topic of another talk. There's a lot to say about that, and so I haven't got time tonight. But what I want to talk through with you tonight is how people, the governments, have used the Misuse of Drugs Act in, a, in progressively inappropriate ways, creating more harm than good. You might say, well, people have said this. People say, well, that's just a load of nuts, cronies getting together and deciding that alcohol is a dangerous drug. Well, actually, that not true at all. The um, process of MCDA actually is very powerful and it is very difficult for any individual to influence the outcome. But more than that, we got a grant under the FP7 scheme from the European Commission. We replicated the study using 30 European experts from 20 different countries and they came to the same result. Alcohol was still the most harmful drug in Europe. And the correlation between the European experts and the British experts was about 0.95, so remarkable correlation. And if you still don't believe it, well, we've just redone it in Australia uh, with Australian experts, and there again, alcohol's still the most harmful drug. So it's, we're pretty clear that if you care about harms, multi-criteria decision analysis is the best way of assessing relative harms of different drugs. And we've done it on other drugs, not. We've done it in specific sorts of drugs, and the one I want to just briefly mention is the MCDA we did on nicotine products. We did this because we were fascinated by the emergence of e-cigarettes or vaping. And so we convened a group to uh, compare the harms of these different forms of nicotine, ranging from cigarettes on the left to, to pharmaceutical products, nasal sprays and patches on the right. Uh, and we looked at the, in this case, there are 14 different harms. And we showed that actually e-cigarettes 
had a harm rating which was about a 25th that of cigarettes. Uh, and we also showed, and I discovered to my surprise, that the, the social harm, the harm of cigarettes to other people is massive. Uh, and actually, one of, those, one of the reasons for that large red bar with cigarettes is that half of all the fires in the world are caused by cigarette stubs. Two and a half thousand people a year die of fires <coughs> caused by them dropping cigarettes onto them or someone else dropping cigarettes onto their beds, etc. And that e-cigarette finding became quite influential. Public Health England, as you, you, may, you may know, have led the world in terms of sensible decision-making around the relative or the value of e-cigarettes as a health reduction, a health production, uh, harm reduction measure. And uh, so this paper has had a huge influence on public health policy in Britain and in also in other countries like New Zealand. So that's what we've achieved. What has the UK government achieved in the last decade? Well, I'm going to just go through some of the worst failures. So alcohol now is the leading cause of death in men under the age of 50, and because women are now drinking more than men, will be the leading cause of death in women under 50 in the next few years. They've banned alternative recreational drugs to alcohol, like CAT and nitrous oxide. Opioid deaths and cocaine deaths have reached a new all-time high year on year. They keep reaching those all-time highs. It's quite an achievement. We've had hundreds of deaths from these substances that you've never heard of, PMA and PMMA, in a failed attempt to stop people using ecstasy. We've suddenly just seen a rise of synthetic cannabinoids. We've now got prisoners dying smoking synthetic cannabinoids in a failed attempt to stop them smoking cannabis, which never killed anyone. And we've got the most repressive drug laws in the world with the Psychoactive Substances Act. And we've had what I would call a willful denial of the failure of these policies. And that willful denial has occurred despite the fact that some people in government, particularly in the coalition government, tried to stop it. But they failed, and I'll talk a bit more about that subsequently. And the reason, of course, that the last three governments that I've been involved with in terms of drug policy have failed to understand what they're doing is wrong is really summed up in this quote attributed to Einstein, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And the problem with British policy is that the political ambition and the policy of the Home Office in relation to drugs is to reduce use. And uh, you'll see that those attempts to reduce use have actually not reduced harms and in many cases have actually increased harms. Now, I suppose most of us would agree that probably death is a, one of the more important harms that a drug can produce. And these are the most recent data we have. About 80,000 people in Britain a year die of uh, tobacco-related uh, death. Half of all smokers die. Those are what economists call a good death because uh, those tobacco smokers pay a lot of tax and die before they can draw their pensions. So they're net contributors to the economy. Now, alcohol kills about 28,000 in the latest data, and they're bad deaths because they're often young people, and as I'll show you, people who could be contributing. And then opiates come down there at about 2,000, and I've deliberately allowed the opiate graph to grow beyond the numbers because to emphasize the fact that, that we are, as I said, year on year exceeding what we used to think was a, an excessive level of opiate deaths, and we're reaching an all-time high uh, of nearly 2,000. Paracetamol, cocaine reached an all-time high of nearly 400, amphetamines, cannabis virtually none, ecstasy growing, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, and methadone very, very few. So if you care about deaths, you should care about alcohol and tobacco and, and opiates. So here's a statistic. This is really uh, a censure of the policy that we have pursued over the last 30 years with alcohol. Alcohol now is the most common reason for death in men under the age of 50. And uh, it will become the leading cause of death in women under the age of 50 because women, the rate of which young women or women up, up to 50 are dying from alcohol-related disorders showed a 6% increase in one year in the latest data we have. 
And as I say, women are drinking more because they're better off and, uh, and they're liberated. And that is a huge problem. And here you see some comparative data comparing the red lines of Scotland and the blue lines England and Wales and the black lines are the European countries. On the left hand side you see mortality rates from alcohol related cirrhosis and liver disease. And you can see how Scotland has gone from having relatively low rates back in the 60s and 70s to having rates which are twice the European average uh, in the 2000s. And that's true both for women on the right and men on the left. And England and Wales are catching up. We've now exceeded the French levels uh, in the last decade. And that's why Scotland has introduced minimum pricing. Because the Scots realise 40% of all intensive care beds in Scotland are occupied by people who have got an alcohol-related illness. And intensive care beds are very, very expensive. And minimum unit pricing <coughs> will reduce consumption of alcohol by about 10%, and that's enough to, for people to be sufficiently less ill. They can be moved out of intensive care and into a normal bed. But what did England and Wales do? Well, they didn't do anything. Well, actually, they did. They did what the drinks industry told them to. And we still allow advertising of alcohol. We don't allow advertising of tobacco, but we allow advertising of alcohol. And the main, the main stay of UK policy on alcohol is to tell people to drink responsibly. When I think most of us probably think the reason for drinking is to become irresponsible, but hell. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is a rather, uh, rather amusing cartoon about David Cameron and... Uh, his visit to Gin Alley. Uh, uh, Cameron has a reputation of coming into power, saying he'll change things in the right direction and then making a rapid U-turn uh, for reasons we don't fully understand, but probably reflect the huge power of the alcohol industry's lobbying. So how does the UK government, how do, they, how do we justify not intervening with this major cause of harm, the largest cause of harm in, uh, of any drug. And we use the argument that alcohol has health benefits. So it's not possible to, or it would be in inexpedient to deal, to reduce alcohol use because we might lose the benefits. Well, let's look at these benefits. So this graph shows on the right-hand side, the blue bars are disbenefits. These are all the harms or the deaths caused attributed to alcohol. Uh, are in blue, and the, the lives saved by the health benefits of alcohol are in green. Well, you can see that the blues have it. <laughs> and at no age is there any net benefit of drinking. And for young people under the age of 44, that there's almost no benefits, health benefits at all. And, and that is the reason why we should do something about alcohol, because it's a very dangerous drug for younger people. Now, if you believe the health benefits saga, then here's the facts for you. If you are a middle-aged man, and you think that drinking, you want to maximize the possible health benefits from drinking, then the optimal dose is five grams a day. So that's half a unit. So that's 60 mils of wine. And the good news is, we're going to be serving very small servings at the reception afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> now the problem with the current Misuse of Drugs Act is it, that it is, like many, many uh, international and national regulations, it's about prohibition. And we have known for over a century that prohibition doesn't necessarily reduce harm. When we stopped the Chinese in London smoking opium, they started injecting heroin. Not a great advantage. Ethanol prohibition in America was an unmitigated disaster. It was revoked after 11 years, seen as the, the impetus to the rise of organized crime like the Mafia, and yet, Politicians still talk about prohibition of other drugs as if you wouldn't get the same thing, but you do get the same thing. When we 
Trying to get rid of cannabis use in prisons and other places has led to the rise of synthetics like spice. To some extent, prohibition of cocaine has led to crack. I'm going to talk about the MDMA, PMA, the saga. And heroin, we have the rise now of synthetics, and particularly the fentanyls, which I'll talk about. So let's look at opiate deaths. So here you see data going back, what, to, back to the early 1990s. Uh, and you can look at the uh, deaths from any opiate. Look at the blue line there. And you can see that uh, the rates of opiate deaths have risen almost inexorably over the past 30 years. And uh, underneath it, I put a red line. The red line with the two arrows is the timeline of the Portuguese experiment. And that's a very interesting, that, that's a, that experiment of decriminalizing uh, personal possession of all drugs, including opiates like heroin, was brought in uh, 18 years ago now in Portugal, largely for economic reasons, because their prisons were filled up with people who were using drugs. They decided to treat drug users as ill rather than as bad, uh, and to have humane interventions. And in those 15 years where we've seen a doubling of opiate deaths in Britain, the Portuguese have seen a fall in opiate deaths to one third of what they were before. And to my mind, that is one of the most powerful justifications for a rational decriminalization approach to drug use and certainly opiate use that you can make. There's the evidence. Why don't we instigate it? Well, we used to. Before the Misuse of Drugs Act in 1971, there was a thing called the British system. We stood up against international pressure, American pressure, to, to ban heroin. We kept it as a medicine. And we allowed doctors to prescribe it. And we had very, very few heroin addicts. We had 1,000 heroin addicts in Britain in 1971, most of them on prescriptions uh, in London. But we disbanded it, that policy, after the Misuse of Drugs Act, because the US did not like us treating heroin addicts with heroin. When we tried to do it, Thatcher and, uh, was told by Regan we had to stop it, so she banned one of the, well, she stopped it being used. There was, a, there was a very innovative treatment program being done in Liverpool. She stopped that happening. Marx moved and he went to New Zealand. And yet, since it's been established as effective in countries like Switzerland, the Netherlands, and Canada, so we know that prescribing and safe injection, providing facilities for safe injection of opiates reduces harms. But we do not instigate it, even though we have police commissioners in this country who want to instigate it, even though the Scottish government wants to instigate it. We do not. We won't do it because our Misuse of Drugs Act won't allow it, and we will not change that act. But really, it is time to think differently. Here's a very sad story, and we're going to see a lot more of these over the next few decades. Here's Robert, a young man, 16-year-old. He goes out. He lives in Maidstone in Kent. He goes out to score some cannabis, which, of course, you have to score because it's illegal. He gets offered some E by the dealer, who says he's got some nice new E. Robert buys that as well. He goes home, and he dies because it's not E, it's fentanyl. And we're seeing the spread of fentanyls into a range of different drugs, mostly opiates, but also these uh, pseudo ecstasies, etc. Yeah. Fentanyl is now so cheap and so powerful that we are going to get, very likely we'll get an epidemic like the Americans have of fentanyl deaths. <laughs> this remarkable graph, this looks at the number of people each year who died as a result of using this drug PMA uh, or PMMA. Uh, phenoxymethylamphetamine. This drug was made illegal in 1971 under the UN Convention, Psychotropic Conventions, and you have very few deaths, you see, until 2008 when there's a big spike and it carries on spiking to 2012. Why would that be? Why, why would people in Britain start dying from this drug which has been illegal for well, 30 years? And it's because it looks like Ecstasy. So on the left is MDMA, and on the right is PMA. And uh, you, you, know, you don't have to be a, 
a great chemist to see that they're sort of vaguely similar. They've got a blue bit on this end and a, a red bit on that end. <laughs> and they're about the same. So the story is fascinating. This is, this is one of the more chilling examples of the failure of prohibition. So MDMA, ecstasy, is made from saffro, which is a, an oil which is extracted from sassafras oil. That's a natural, sassafras oil comes from plants. And uh, in 1998, I think, the United Nations uh, decided that the way to stop, it, they, was ir they were irritated that people were still using ecstasy, even though it had been made illegal for about 15 years. So they thought, well, how can we stop people getting hold of ecstasy? So they said, well, well let's ban the precursor. So they banned saffron. And not much happened until 2008, when there was a massive seizure. In Thailand, they seized 50 tons of saffron. Uh, and that's half the world's supply of, or enough to make half the world's supply of MDMA. And they thought, great, UN, right over the front page of the UN newspaper, we have broken the back of ecstasy production. People will stop using ecstasy. Well, for a while they did. But the problem is, if you're an underground chemist in, in China and you've got an, uh, an order for a kilo of MDMA from uh, a dealer in Rotterdam, and you say, sorry, Gov, I can't, uh, I can't make the, uh, the MDMA, I'm going to saffron, you're going to be killed. So what do you do? You hunt around desperately to find an oil that looks a bit like saffron, that you can make something that no one would know wasn't MDMA. So they turn to anethol, aniseed oil. Now that is a widely, widely used product or precursor in cosmetics, foodstuffs, uh, and uh, well, many other aspects of life. So you can't ban anethol. So they made anethol, but when you put anethol through the same processes, of synthesis that you get to get MDMA. You don't. You get PMA and PMMA. And these are much more toxic substances. And that's why people were dying. So this attempt to stop people getting hold of ecstasy led to deaths, many, many deaths from these uh, alternatives. And, and it got even worse then because after about seven or eight years, Chinese chemists worked out a way of making saffron directly rather than from sassafras oil. And they got so good at that that now we have a glut of saffron, which is why the ecstasy tablets now are 250 milligrams a tablet, whereas in the old days they were just 50 milligrams. And that's why we've got a rise in ecstasy deaths because ecstasy has become very, very cheap and, uh, and people are using it in much stronger amounts. So you kill people by encouraging the production of alternatives, and now we're killing people because it's become too powerful and too available. And here's a very interesting graph, which looks at the comparative toxicity of a range of different drugs. And this is produced by uh, uh, Les King, one of the drug science uh, experts for many years. And more is bad. More is more toxic. So heroin, the most toxic. PMA, you can see the red bar at the top. About... Uh, uh, this is a log two scale, about twice as toxic as MDMA, which is why more people were dying from PMA than were dying from MDMA. But you'll also see mephedrone, MCAT, meow, meow. <coughs> that's about four times less toxic than MDMA. Now, mephedrone is a very, very interesting drug because mephedrone became widely available in the UK in the... Uh, latter part of the first, uh, the, the, the zeros of this 2000s. And, um, and here is a remarkable story. Uh, I had a, perhaps the most surreal phone call in my life. I was, uh, I was rung up by CNN. I'd done an interview with them a few days before on uh, <coughs> mephedrone and whether it was dangerous or not. And they said, where's Scunthorpe? And that's a question you don't get asked very often. <laughs> and I said, why? And they said, well, the uh, Humberside police have called an international press conference to tell the world that they believe two young men have died from taking Meow Meow, MCAT, Mephedrone. And, uh, and I said, well, that's pretty unlikely. I just, just, you know, within the previous month had received the Israeli government report. It's an Israeli drug. It was invented 
there as a, as a, a biological control of aphids on, on, uh, on plants, was then deviated into recreational use. And um, they estimated about 450,000 Israelis had used methadone regularly, and there had not been a single death. So I said it's pretty unlikely that there have been two deaths in Scunthorpe one night. But anyway, drive up the M1 for five hours and turn right. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if they ever did, but if they had gotten there, what they would have seen was this. They would have seen the, the police saying, we believe these lads had used methadone, but also had used methadone, an opiate, to bring them down from the high of methadone. I mean, that's pretty absurd. And they'd been drinking heavily till 2 AM. And then this next dad was dragged out into the press conference, weeping as he urged youngsters to avoid the drug. I don't want him to be labeled a druggie, because he wasn't. He was just on a night out with friends, enjoying himself, a normal, caring, hard-working lad. Now, every word in that sentence is correct, except for one. And I've made it easy for you, because it's highlighted. He was a druggie. He was an alcohol druggie. He died because he was so drunk that when he took methadone, not methadone, he stopped breathing. Now, I believe the police knew that. But if they rung CNN and said, we've had two deaths from alcohol and methadone, they'd have shrugged their shoulders and said, well, there's, you know, there's seven in Chicago every night, so what's the big deal? But if you say there's a new scary drug that's named after a cat sound, wow, that's news. And the, that's the only way you're going to get CNN to Scunthorpe. <laughs> and there was a huge media clamor to get the drug banned. And it was banned. It was banned without any evidence, certainly that it hardly killed anyone. Of course, it got banned because of the sun. <laughs> Is the sun here? Are we have a sun reporter here? It's not the fire alarm. <laughs> <laughs> I just love this. Legal drug teen ripped his scrotum off. When I give this, show this slide in, in foreign countries, they say, Is that English? And I say, No, that's sunnish. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If it, 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 we, we, could, we tried to find out who this person was, but the sun said they didn't know. It was just, but they've been told it was true. <laughs> and the story is quite interesting because this happened just before the 2010 election. And here's the statement that Alan Johnson made uh, uh, in January, just before the 2011 election. He said, unanimous recommendation to ban the drug made by the scientists, clinicians, and other experts on the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs to prevent tragedies in the future was based on painstaking evidence. Because, of course, all evidence in government is painstaking, isn't it? <laughs> this was the evidence. Actually, the ACMD hadn't done any research. No one even knew what the drug did. There was no pharmacology. They couldn't even be bothered to spend a, you know, a couple of afternoons doing some bench work. And the ACMD said, we'd like to emphasize that methadone and the related cathinones are likely to be harmful. Huh. Which translates to, if it looks like amphetamine, then make it class B like amphetamine. And that's what they did. They made methadone a class B drug just because it looked like amphetamine. Now you might say, well, fine, what's wrong with that? You know, banning a new drug couldn't do any harm, could it? You know, you know, it's not going to do any good having the drug out there, so why not ban it? But actually, banning drugs can do harm, as the ACMD discovered. Because when they banned all the other cathinones, like methadone, they discovered they'd banned this drug, which is an antidepressant and anti-smoking agent called Zyban, bupropion. Well, that look, that's a cathinone. And they had to change the act. So the law says all cathinones except this one are illegal. And the implication of that is that we will never get another bupropion. If we wanted to find a better bupropion to treat smoking cessation, to help people get stopped quit smoking, we can't use cathinones because they're all illegal now. So basically, a whole avenue of research has been eliminated in an attempt to stop people getting around the law on methadone. So that's one example of how banning a drug is bad. Here's another example. What do people do? Well, they decided to make a better methadrone, monkey dust. And now we've seen some interesting outbreaks of very, very disturbed behavior, much more disturbed behavior than we ever saw on methadrone. But perhaps most interestingly of all is this graph, which shows the profile of deaths from cocaine and amphetamine during the period when methadrone was available. You see, the black line, cocaine deaths rising up and up and up and up, uh, amphetamine deaths going up similarly, till the 
availability of methadone. And then suddenly, these deaths from cocaine and amphetamine fall. Why? Because people switch. Because methadone is legal, so you don't get arrested and you don't lose your career for taking it. It's much less harmful than cocaine. Uh, and uh, the cocaine at that time wasn't so good anyway. So you can see that we've, we've methadone, the availability of methadone probably saved several hundred people from dying from cocaine. And then, of course, it gets banned for this political reason. It got banned because it could, they thought it would help Labour get re-elected. And you can see cocaine deaths rise and rise again. Now we have the highest number of deaths ever. Because if everything's illegal, well, you may as well take cocaine because it's more fun than methadrone. But when methadrone was legal, you could buy it in one gram quantities and that wasn't going to kill you. So this is perhaps the most interesting natural experiment in how the availability of a less harmful uh, drug can reduce the toxicity and the harms of more harmful drugs. A fantastic natural experiment. And we can see similar problems with the opening of the Pandora's box relating to synthetic cannabinoids. For reasons no one really understands, it was decided that prisoners would be tested for drugs. Because putting them in prison wasn't enough punishment. They had to be told, made not to use drugs. And prisoners were therefore getting uh, detected for smoking cannabis, because cannabis will hang around in your, your body for months. And they'd soon wised up. They'd realize they'd lose, you know, perhaps they'd be in prison for two years longer. They'd lose their probation uh, if they smoked cannabis. So they stopped smoking cannabis. They started smoking heroin and using other drugs like pregabalin. And then they realized that they could get hold of these synthetic cannabinoids, which were different chemically to cannabis and therefore not detected by the testing system. So they started using synthetic cannabinoids. And this created a huge market for synthetic cannabinoids. And there's a lot of them. Very, very, very many of them. But most of them have never been tested on humans. We've got a situation now where 90% of inmates <coughs> in some open prisons are using these synthetic cannabinoids called spice on a regular basis. It's estimated about 5% of prison officers are now corrupted. They're dealing, they're, t they're basically taking spice into prisons. You can take a piece of paper this size, you can soak it in uh, water that's got spice in it, you can dry it out, you can write I love you daddy on it and get it sent into a prison uh, as a, a letter to a prisoner and you can cut that up into a hundred pieces each worth ten pounds. Because the synthetic cannabinoids are so powerful and potent that you need a very tiny amount to produce the effect. So what did the government do? Well, it decided to ban synthetic cannabinoids. And the first lot of synthetic cannabinoids were actually ones that had been tried in humans. They were rejected as medicines. They were going to be medicines. They were rejected because they were too unpleasant. They were made in the 70s. So, so what, did, what did the underground chemists do? Well, they then started making the second generation of cannabinoids. And these had been tested in animals, so they weren't desperately poisonous, but they were very unpleasant. But they got banned. And then they decided they were going to... The uh, chemists started making these new third-generation drugs, which had never been tested on anything before, except the people that start using them. And these are very unpleasant and very toxic. And uh, 60 deaths last year from synthetic cannabinoids in prison, through seizures and through heart, heart attacks. Every prison in Britain now has an army of very large male paramedics to deal with the crises uh, produced by people going very psychotic or becoming, uh, having severe seizures from these third generation cannabinoids. What did the government do? The government said, we're going to ban everything that could ever look like a cannabinoid. Uh, the problem is, when they tried to do that, it, it became very clear that they would also ban many compounds. Glaxo, GSK, GlaxoSmithKline alone had 70,000 70, compounds in their test bed, which were, would have become illegal under the, the new cannabis legislation. And that would actually potentially destroy UK research. And I've written about that in The Lancet. And it, it's absurd. You cannot approach uh, harm reduction of drugs like, complex drugs like cannabinoids by trying to 
ban every chemical that could look like one of them because you'll end up banning drugs like indomethazine, candosartan, etc. So that was a, a and in fact we still don't know what to do with these drugs now because our policies are about banning chemicals, not about controlling use and harm. And what's worse, the ACMD also banned the only naturally occurring antidote to spice, <laughs> THCV. Why? Well, why? Because they thought if you injected it, you might get a little high. Not that anyone ever would. But, you know, the mental state, the attitude is always ban. So, if, you know, let's just ban everything because it can't do any harm. But it does more harm than good. In fact, there's a litany of drugs which have been banned, which are medicines. And uh, I'm not going to read all of them, but you can see there are many, many illegal drugs which were medicines. Even methadone itself was being developed as a treatment for addiction which actually it turned out to be, even though it was never tested in clinical trials. It certainly got stopped people dying from cocaine. But the current regulations make it almost impossible to research on them because they're all put into what's called Schedule 1. And in Schedule 1, they're deemed to have both no medical <coughs> value and be very dangerous. And working with drugs in Schedule 1 is close to impossible. Uh, and I know that because I have spent many years doing that. It's hugely tedious, very, very wasteful of time and money. Now, people say, well, the UN conventions and the, and the Misuse of Drugs Act don't actually say you cannot research these drugs, but they make it virtually impossible. And this graph shows what happened when to psychedelics. So the, this is the, the graph shows the number of publications each year on LSD in blue and psilocybin, magic mushroom juice, in red. And they reached a peak about 1970, and then that was when they were banned. And for a couple of years, people still had data to publish. And then you can see the precipitate fall in the number of publications. And the reason for that is twofold. One is that working with these drugs becomes very, very difficult. And the second thing is governments won't fund research on these drugs because funding research on these drugs is seen as tantamount to encouraging their use. So they've almost, they almost disappeared from use until groups like mine started resurrecting them a few years ago. And the same is true for cannabinoids. People say, well, we don't have much evidence that cannabis is a medicine. And one of the reasons we don't have much evidence is because it's virtually impossible to work with cannabis to study it because of the fact that it was until recently a Schedule I drug. And you can see, as with the psychedelics, making it illegal produced a precipitate fall in research. And now it gets worse. We have this Psychoactive Substances Act. This is truly the most ridiculous law probably ever enacted. It bans basically any drug that is psychoactive. Psychoactive defined as a drug which either activates or depresses the brain. It was designed to stop head shops selling weak stimulants, used to be called bubbles or sparkle, uh, largely methylpropylamine. They're about as strong as a couple of cups of coffee. So the head shops were stopped selling these drugs. What happened? Well, the back street dealers didn't stop, they, but they didn't bother to sell the safe stimulants, they started selling synthetic cannabinoids and the strong cathinones and fentanyls because the black market is much less concerned about the health of its customers than the head shops were. In fact, the only psychoactive substances allowed in this country <laughs> are alcohol, tobacco and caffeine. And the grounds for exempting those from the act are precedent, not the fact that they're safe or not harmful. Just precedent. So if you were to discover a drug today that was made you cleverer or made you live longer or made you happier or a nicer person, it would be illegal. Why? I don't know. But that's what the Act says. One of the reasons for the Act was this hysteria that was developed around nitrous oxide. Now, I feel quite passionately about it. This is a British drug, a great British invention. <laughs> There he is, one of the presidents, a Bristolian no less, Davy, Humphrey Davy, president of the Royal Society, discovered with Priestley nitrous oxide, enjoyed it, liked it, thought it was an interesting way of understanding different forms of consciousness, but it was also an interesting chemical. In 200 years of, since it was discovered, there have been virtually no deaths. And I would say, is that not precedent enough? What is the definition of precedent? If 200 years isn't enough, why, why are we banning something that's been around for that long? It's been used by millions of women in childbirth. And even Prince Harry used it. It didn't get banned because, you know, when he was using it. What got it banned? What got it banned was that footballers were using it. 
And why do footballers and other young people use it? Well, because they're not stupid. They realize that actually it's a lot safer than many of the other drugs they might use. The effect is strong, and it's fast, and it's pleasurable. But you recover it in minutes, so you're back in control. Whatever. If you get the same level of high from an al alcohol, it would last for perhaps 24 hours. You'd be drunk, and then you'd be, and then you'd be hungover. So young people use it because it reduces the risk of them being vulnerable to assault. They can drive. They don't have a hangover. And that's why soccer players use it. They can have a, go to a party with the full knowledge that the next day they can play as, as good a game as they would have played if they hadn't taken it. It's less toxic to the body than alcohol, and it's less addictive than alcohol. But the son really wanted to get this drug banned. And he wanted to use football players as the impetus for that. Now they knew, the son, even the son knew that to try to, uh, a national call to ban laughing gals would make them look the laughing stock. So they had to change its name. And they changed its name to Hippie Crack, which is an absurd name for anyone that knows what nitrous oxide is. No self-respecting hippie will use it, and uh, <laughs> it's not a bit like crack. <laughs> But this, new, this, this is a great name for scaring people that don't know about it. You just imagine, oh my God, tie-dyes and flares are coming back and they're on crack. I mean, <laughs> my God, the world's going to end. And it got, it, and it got banned. And, it, uh, and I've spent quite a lot of time in court trying to stop people going to prison for selling it. So why have the UK government's got it so wrong? Well, the first thing, I've repeated it, what I've said earlier, the policy is wrong. The policy is about use reduction which is not a useful policy. The best policy is harm reduction. We've seen politicians of different parties, the Labour and the Tory parties, playing tougher than thou against the opposition to appease the voters. We've got the right-wing media th and think tanks that have invented these terms like hippie crack. I wrote a paper called Lies, Damn Lies and Legal High Statistics. The hysteria around legal highs was fueled by right-wing think tanks that consistently lied about the harms and the number of deaths, even though the government itself said they were lying, they continued to lie. And they've ignored evidence from coalition partners and from the ACMD quite a few times. The ACMD has come up with sensible suggestions the government has ignored. And there have been a few casualties to this. In coalition, the Lib Dems did try to do something. They, Ed Davey said, well, the drug laws aren't working. We need to look at the evidence, and he was castigated. And Norman Baker resigned, a drugs minister resigned because he could not engage in a debate with the Home Secretary, a certain woman, I think she was called May, can you remember her, I don't know. <laughs> and he said this when he resigned, he resigned as a minister because he said the Home Office have looked upon drugs policy as a conservative department in a conservative government. The Home Office basically, he said, was a branch of the Tory party, not an independent branch of the uh, executive. But they're all quite blind to their own, aren't they? Here's Victoria Atkins, a drugs minister who can't speak about cannabis because her husband makes so much money selling it. And, um, and then there's Michael Gove. And this is truly, I think a lot of people thought, this has got to be the last straw, isn't it? So you cannot be a teacher if you admit to taking cocaine, but you can become the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. I mean. The iniquity in that I mean, even gets to even, I hope, Tory voters. Mind you, there are one or two honest Tories. There's old Boris. That's an outrageous slur. Of course I've taken drugs, yes. <laughs> <laughs> <I think. laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, uh, it turned out to be caster sugar, apparently, but anyway. <laughs> I wonder if any of you can guess who's coming up next. Well, you, this, is the, this is actually the one, one of the few good guys. And that's Crispin Blunt. Now, Crispin's a, a very interesting MP because he actually did try to bring in a more rational law. During the Psychoactive Substances Act, he, he campaigned successfully to argue that poppers, uh, amyl nitrites, should be excluded from the Psychoactive Substances Act because they had harm reduction value. And he won that argument. It's a pity he didn't broaden his, uh, his campaign against nitrous oxide, because poppers are nitric oxide. Maybe he thought they were all the same. But anyway, at least he did something. And the good thing is he's part of a small parliamentary group in the Tory party that are trying to have a, bring in a much more rational approach to drugs. And we commend him for that. 
I'm going to finish by telling you the last piece of research that the uh, drug science has done. And this is something even more challenging than looking at the harms of drugs. It's looking at the value of policies. It's all right, they're friends of mine. <laughs> we got money from the Norwegian government. Norway is a fascinating country, the richest country in the world per capita. Death rates from heroin, twice those of Scotland. Why is that? Well, they can afford it. And they don't have any treatment, and they don't believe in harm reduction. They're deep Puritans. And uh, we got funding from uh, the, their research council to work with some economists in uh, Oslo to see if we could develop a methodology for assessing the uh, value of different policies. And uh, Larry and uh, our team worked together to do an assessment of different policies. And this is much more difficult than assessing harms. Perfect timing, Larry. I've just introduced you again. <laughs> it turns out there are 27 variables you have to take into consideration when you're looking at the value of different policies. And that you can see they fall into sev seven different areas, health, social, political, public, crime, economic, and cost impacts. So we have to define each of those, and then we had to take dr a drug or two drugs. We managed to do a couple of drugs. And you have to score each drug on those 27 variables. But you also have to look at different policies. And there are ult you know, an infinite number of different policies. So we decided to take four exemplars. One is the red one there, which the drug is illegal and you have strong sanctions. You put people in prison for using or possessing it. The second is the orange. The, the drug is illegal but under weak sanctions. It's almost a sort of decriminalization type model. And then the yellow um, row, a state control where you have regulated access uh, through something like a pharmacy. And then the green is a complete free market where there's no control whatsoever, so no restrictions on anyone using it, buying it, selling it. Uh, and so you then take a drug, you go through all, each of those 27 areas of policy, you see how each one is affected uh, by the different policies, and you eventually, after a lot of work, takes about a day for each drug, you come up with this. And we're only able really to do it with these two drugs. And what they both show is that the second bar in uh, is the best. So up is better. On the left, you've got alcohol. On the right, cannabis. On the left, you see the free market for alcohol is not as good as state control. State control is better than decriminalization and absolute prohibition. So for alcohol, state control, the Swedish model of alcohol control is the best. On the right, you've got cannabis. Interestingly, cannabis turned out to be more extreme. State control was considerably much better than decriminalization and way, way better than absolute prohibition. So, so you can see for cannabis, we got it almost exactly wrong in this country. But you'll be pleased to know the Dutch have got it right, so uh, at least we can take some um, evidence there. And for both drugs, the bottom line is a regulated market is the best way of minimizing harms and benefiting uh, people overall. So I'm going to finish now by just throwing out some guidance to the next government. Hopefully there will be one. Um, <laughs> So the first thing we should do is take drug policy from the Home Office, the Department of Health and Social Services. The problem with the Home Office is that they have spent the last 50 years prohibiting things. Their mental s approach is about banning, it's about policing, it's about stopping. And I think it's impossible for them to welcome any intervention that isn't uh, about legal constraints. So the Department of Health will be much better placed to do that. In most countries, drug control is vested in health because it's a harm issue. We should have testing, not just at festivals, we should have the Dutch model of testing. The Dutch have a national scheme of testing. If people want to take drugs that aren't legal and aren't produced in a regulated way, they can get them tested. And that helps people avoid taking drugs that are dangerous. But it also tells the Dutch government what drugs are out there, and when nasty things come along, like a lot of PMA, they can put out announcements so people don't take them. 
And here's a nice quote from what we're doing in Britain. Uh, Fiona Meacham, one of the drug science members, uh, runs an organization called The Loop, which does test it festivals. And I like this, I like this um, statement, just say no, because if you don't, you do know, you might stay alive. To deal with fentanyls, we're going to have to have safe injection rooms. And we're going to have, have a massive rollout of naloxone uh, as the antidote to opiates to thwart the expansion of fentanyls. And I believe we should have regulated access of drugs less harmful to users than alcohol. Because I think it's immoral that the only drug you can use to relax yourself and have fun socially is a drug which is more harmful than alternatives. That's not only immoral, it's also illogical because it compounds the harms of alcohol when there are safer alternatives. And we should also rectify the scandal of medical cannabis. And it's a year since cannabis was made in medicine. There have been 10 prescriptions in the whole of the country. It's outrageous. It's, it's a fraud. It's, it's actually a, it's a, an example of, I think, incompetence. There may be dishonesty there. And uh, we, have to, we have to change this. I said earlier on that we, we believe drug science had an influence in changing, getting the WHO to agree that cannabis was a medicine. They've agreed now. Actually, the UN haven't agreed because the US and Russia and China haven't allowed them to agree. But it is a medicine. It should be a medicine. And one of the things that drug science is going to do, and we're going to launch this next week, is our initiative called the 2021 initiative. We're going to see if we can get 20,000 people who would benefit from medical cannabis into uh, treatment with standardized ratings of, uh, of efficacy and outcome over the next two years. And we're working with charities such as the United Patients Alliance and End Our Pain to do that. And then, of course, the good news is we've got an election. <laughs> and if you care about drug policies, then you've got a choice. It's either between the Lib Dems and Greens, because they're the only two parties that have agreed that the policies are wrong and they should be changed. And both have agreed they'll make recreational cannabis legal. I believe both will almost certainly say we should decriminalize personal possession. And uh, you, yeah, that's, I hope that's going to be in their manifestos. And, uh, and if it is, and if they were to get into influence, we might perhaps get some change. And if, I suspect we're going to have to wait to one or the, other, or the other two major parties to grow up and be honest about drugs uh, before that happens. But anyway, there is a, a glimmer of hope. And I'll stop now. And uh, thanks, thanks for your attention. I'll take questions. I think we should just press straight on. So Alex is going. To, Alex Stevens is going to say a few remarks, reflecting what he's heard, and indeed maybe talk a bit about the ACMD. So, Alex, over to you. Thanks, Richard, and thanks, David. Um, my name is Alex Stevens. I'm professor in criminal justice at the University of Kent. But I think the reason I've been invited to speak at this event is because ten years after David was sacked as chair of the ACMD. I resigned last month from the ACMD. Um, David Gover just gave a great talk. <laughs> it's the first time I've been applauded for not doing any work. <laughs> David's great talk just started with a reference to Brave New World. And in Brave New World, um, Huxley, through his character Mostafa Mond, the controller, um, gives his definition of philosophy as the finding of bad reasons for believing in things that you already believe for other bad reasons. <laughs> and this reminds me very strongly of the Home Office's typical response to ACMD re recommendations which it wishes to reject. Normally you'll see the same boilerplate um, press statement that the Home Office has no plans to decriminalise drugs, no plans to change in any way because we're already doing everything that we need to be doing to reduce drugs and related harms. And so the Home Office rejects recommendations. It sometimes sacks people um, when it disagrees with the things they say. But there are other more insidious ways in which the Home Office avoids implementing evidence-based policy. One of those is to pretend to accept recommendations and then do nothing to implement them. So in 2016, the ACMD put a report out on reducing opioid-related deaths of which the main recommendation was to maintain investment in opioid substitution treatment 
of optimal dosage and duration. In its response to that recommendation, the government said it accepted it. Four years later, we find from the figures released by the Department of Communities and Local Government that funding for drug treatment services in England has been cut by 27%, not growing as it should be in the face of a drug death crisis, not even maintained as the ACMD recommended it should be, but cut. A second way the Home Office can avoid implementing recommendations is to pretend that it's already doing the things that it's been recommended to do. So last year I was working on a report on custody community transitions and the drug-related harms therein, quite often resulting in death, because the period after release from custody is one of the most dangerous in the lives of an opioid user. And we recommended that that is especially dangerous when people are released on Fridays because people have to go to several appointments, probation, um, the job centre, the drug treatment centre, are often released too late to go to any of those with a weekend ahead of them with nothing in their pocket apart from four to six pounds, quite often with no, sh no, room to, no shelter to have either. The government in its response that came out two weeks ago said, oh, we don't need to change the law because our policy is already in place to improve the services that people get on Friday afternoons. Now, there will be plenty of people in this room who know perfectly well that drug treatment services are not funded to expand the services they provide over the weekend, let alone to maintain what was already existing. So it's just not honest to say that the government has this in hand. A third way that the government can avoid implementing evidence-based recommendations is to avoid those recommendations being created in the first place <laughs> by carefully selecting the people who are producing them. Um, so when it came to light earlier this year that the government had instigated a round of appointing experts to the ACMD, a body which is supposed to be independent from government, indeed has that independence from government guaranteed in a protocol between the Home Secretary and the ACMD that was put in place after David was sacked. Um, there was an independent panel that, that assessed applications, found some people to be appointable, but thereafter it came out subsequently, the government, and presumably this was special advisors to ministers, um, vetted those people, not just on their views on drug policy, but on what they tweeted about Brexit and Windrush. And then there were people who were considered appointable who were then not appointed. One of them was Neve Eastwood, the director of release, a very highly experienced and renowned lawyer in this field. There are other cases who don't want to be in the public domain. When this came to light, I asked for the government to be more transparent about how it was making the decisions about who gets to be on the ACMD and to give assurances that it would not interfere in those decisions on the basis of people's political opinions. That transparency and those assurances have not been forthcoming which is why I resigned from the ACMD a few weeks ago. So there's these three ways of avoiding evidence, but when all, those, all else has failed and these evidence-based recommendations do come out, the final way the government tries to avoid them is through what I've called the moral sidestep. And we saw this in very strong action when Theresa May was Prime Minister, with repeated calls to follow the evidence and introduce drug consumption rooms in order to save lives in the face of a drug death crisis, a public health emergency, as it's been called by the Health and Social Care Select Committee. When she was challenged on this in Parliament, on the basis of the evidence from many countries that have introduced these drug consumption rooms and therefore saved lives, she didn't take on the evidence. She didn't say, I don't agree with you that these things save lives. What she said is, I am not like you, a liberal. Therefore presenting herself as tough. This pursuit of tough policies on the basis of a conservative morality of puritanism and control is one of the main barriers we have to introducing evidence-informed policies in this country. And I'm very afraid that as we go into this election campaign, we're going to see more and more of it. We already have Priti Patel and Boris Johnson coming out with a raft of policies that make them look tough on law and order that now have no evidence behind them. For example, expanding the prison population as a way of reducing crime. So it's a shame that 10 years later, after David, David Sacking, we can't say there's been much progress in evidence-informed policy. I'm looking forward to hearing your questions and statements about how we could improve the situation. Thank you. Thank you very the much. The good news is, Alex, that there is a natural home for you since you've left the ACMD, and it's called Drug Science. <laughs> and I would like to welcome you to join us there. <laughs>
Thank you, David, and thank you, Alec. Okay, we have some time for questions. We've obviously had a slightly disrupted evening, evening and I can only apologise for that, but I would like to get as many questions in as we can in the time available. So could I encourage people to ask quick questions and short questions rather than make speeches and make statements? And once you've asked the question, give the microphone back so we can get the microphones moving as much as we can. I'll take some questions from the, from the lower level first, then we'll come up to the upper level, so we will come to you. Uh, if we take one, so there's a chap there, and, yep, there's, yep, okay. Hi, my name's Alex Armitage, I'm from the Green Party Drugs Working Group. Um, thanks for your talk. Um, one of the things that got me interested in drugs was reading the book that's up there, um, and in that book you um, talk about uh, a, a potential, or a rumour of a, a, a sort of deal made between, um, I think, Gordon Brown during his election campaign in, just before 2010, and and one of the editors of the right-wing press, whereby he would get a good ride in the press if he agreed to um, be sort of tough on drugs. Um, yes, I, think I was wondering if you could yeah. sort of expand on, on that, because I think it's I don't think important. it's in the public domain. Right. <laughs> Strangely, well, it, isn't it? It's in your book. <laughs> it's in the book, but that, yes. But uh, I, my understanding was, and, um, but again, it's very hard to... I was told by uh, individuals who were uh, in government at the time that there was a meeting... Uh, between the editor of the Mail, Paul Dacre, and Gordon Brown. Uh, and Brown actually asked Dacre if the Mail would support him in the 2011 ele 10 election. And um, apparently Dacre said, yes, if you do three things, reduce the top rate of income tax from 50 to 45%, cap immigration at 200,000 and reclassify cannabis. And I believe that each of those happened. I think that's a fact. What didn't happen was the male didn't support <laughs> Gordon in the election, which he should have known that wasn't going to happen. And he kind of sold his soul and the soul of the Labour Party for yeah, uh, a rather you know, paltry outcome. But that's all alleged, I can't. Uh, but I'm quite happy to be sued <laughs> by Paul Dacre on it. Okay, thank you. We'll take the chap here, yep, down here. And then, yep. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, firstly, I'm sorry I was late. I was in Bristol dosing MDMA today, which, um, I, think, do, uh, which I think is a wonderful validation, 10 years on since I contributed to your sacking by submitting a paper on MDMA to the ACMD report. That, so my question, Whilst I fully support what 2021 are doing by collecting real-world data to try and demonstrate the safety and efficacy of cannabis, why are we having to do that in this country? Why can't we just be like America and Canada and all these other countries that just roll out chem um, cannabis prescribing? Um, I understand that real-world data is a faster and more efficient way of doing it than RCTs, but why do we have to do it at all? If it wasn't necessary in Canada and the States, why here? Because we're very special. And we have to, we're not allowed to consider evidence from other people. We have to generate our own. We have a very, very conservative medical profession. And uh, actually, most doctors, I think, almost resent the idea that there might be a treatment which has been driven by patients. Uh, so it's a complex mixture of sort of intellectual arrogance, fear of doctors, <laughs> ignorance of doctors. And uh, the fact that, but, the reality is also, of course, we have a single large provider called the NHS, and if, it, and if the NHS does, which is directed by NICE, and if NICE decides something isn't going to be cost-effective, it's uh, the NHS is going to provide it. So we have very little. There's very little medical autonomy in this country as well. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's a kind of, you know, it's um, a perfect storm of negativity, and that's the problem. So there's the gentleman there, and then we'll go up to the the upper, upper floor if there's an upper level if there's any. Uh, questions from there. Hi, thanks very much for both your talks. Um, my name's Mayfer Busby, I'm, I'm a journalist. And I, I just wonder, I know you've put forward a number of recommendations that have been sort of tried and tested in other countries, um, and especially with, with decriminalization in yeah. Portugal. But is that really the, the end goal, or, or should it be for, for policymakers and, and campaigners? So what, we, what do you think a potential kind of regulated market. No, I actually believe like. in a regulated market for old drugs that are less harmful than alcohol. I think that is the, 
as the most rational, sensible, and going to be the most effective course. Yeah. But decriminalisation would be a good start. Uh, I think it would give people confidence that you can change laws without there being a catastrophic sort of swing of the pendulum in a, in a very dangerous direction. Yeah. Uh, and we can say it works. We know that works. Uh, um, I think the way we would have to begin to regulate drugs is we're going to have to think to follow the American route then, which is where you see cannabis is, becomes regulated. And now we're seeing that some states have now, uh, well, so Denver and Oakland have now allowed mushrooms back as a, as a commodity without, you know, as a legal commodity. I think we, we could, if we watch those roll out, it'll become somewhat easier for us to justify the same kind of approach. But, but I would like to do that, but it, I think that's just, that, you know, it may be too big a jump, unless, of course, the Green Party get in, in which case it's going to happen. <laughs> right, Alex, you wanted to... I just want to make a brief comment on that question. I don't, for, to my mind, no, no policy is the end goal. It's not our aim to have a particular policy in place. The aim is to reduce the harms of drugs <laughs> and to find an optimal point where we're reducing the harms of both an illicit market and the public health harms that are associated with the use of these substances. And so the end goal is to find that mix of policies that does that. I don't think it should be an aim to decriminalise or to regulate just for itself. Thank you. Uh, right, we have a question from the lady there. And then, yes, there's a, another question, I think, up here. Is there anyone else on the top row would like to ask a question while we are... Got the microphones up there, or just two for now? That's fine. Right. Uh, my name's Rachel Wright. I'm a journalist. Um, I might have got this wrong, but I thought on your presentation... First of all, you said there'd been no de deaths from cannabis, and then on the graph, there was slight mm. red, and you said a couple, and I in just... In prison, I, so there are no deaths from cannabis in prison, 60 deaths from spice in prison. Deaths from cannabis, they're probably about two or three a year, yeah. So, and, and it, does it, is it the drug itself, or is it people killing themselves because of... No, it's effect? usually uh, uh, old men who've got cardiovascular disease who get... So cannabis increases your heart rate and blood pressure, so people sometimes have heart attacks. Right, so it's, a not couple of no, that, it's not true to say that cannabis never no. has never caused a death. Uh, no, I think right. you can say it never caused. Yeah, you can. Never, but water kills more people than cannabis <laughs> <laughs> each year. It's about seven people die of water poisoning in Britain each year. Um, hiya, I'm, my name is Claudia. I'm a social worker. I. My question is about whether the opioid crisis that is reported on in the States challenges the idea that a regulated market yeah, so. could reduce harm. Um, and I guess I've got a question in that which I haven't formulated about the role of ph the pharmaceutical industry mm -hmm. in reducing harm. Yeah, the American opioid, the good news is that the new edition, the second edition of my book is coming out in January. And there's a whole section on the American opioid crisis, which, which is complicated. Uh, distilling it down very briefly, yeah, it's, it's, rather, it's a kind of classic American example of excess. First, you have excessive prescribing, which is down to a very active and aggressive pharmaceutical marketing uh, system. And then you have extreme overreaction, which is stop prescribing, put doctors in prison for prescribing, which then takes a hundreds of thousands of people who've been overprescribed into withdrawal. So then they go out on the streets to treat their withdrawal and their addiction with black market drugs. And then they get even more potent ones, which kill them. So, that's, so the most remarkable statistic in the US opiate crisis is 20,000 people in America dying from heroin last year. Now, heroin is not a medicine, and heroin has, has not been a medicine in America since 1948. So it, that is not over-prescribing. Those are people who have been stopped being given OxyContin, who are going out to find another opiate, and they're finding heroin on the streets and they're dying because of that. So it's a perfect storm of, of getting it wrong to start with, overreacting and not having any treatment facilities once you've done that. Hmm. Thank you. 
Yeah, um, Fiona Fox from the Science Media Centre. My question was to Alex, actually, about your resignation. Um, did you get any response from the Home Office, either privately or publicly? Um, and do you think it in any way damages their reputation? Because, of course, the other thing we remember is that 10 years ago, this was incredibly damaging, I think, to the government. And David was absolutely brilliant, did back-to-back -back media and really made uh, the best of the situation. But nothing has changed, even, even regulations that were put in place to protect the independence of independent scientific advisory committees are just being ignored. They were meant to be able to use independent press officers and for, for their reports not to be managed completely by Home Office community communications people and that hasn't happened. So what kind of further plans are there? I've seen emails from you guys about the next stage in this kind of lobbying to allow independent advisors to communicate their advice independently. To answer your first question, I've had no response personally from the Home Office. The public response from the Home Office is that we followed the public appointment process and we have to be able to choose suitable, is the word they use, people. I think suitable in this context is a really interesting <laughs> word to use because it gives a, a window into what they think suitability means, which is people who are going to, who, who are not going to give them inconvenient truths. Um, in terms of what we do about that, I think one of the things we need to do is to investigate whether the problem goes wider than this. There are a whole range of scientific advisory panels that might well be being subject to the same sort of vetting. They, they have said that this vetting was stepped up after Toby Young was thrown off the Office of, office of Students. And Toby Young is not, on a, not a suitable person to be in any public body due to the misogynist and homophobic comments he's made on Twitter. But that does not apply, certainly, to Neve Eastwood. But if, the, if the, the fact that people like Toby Young were mistakenly appointed to a public body is being used to expand the scope of vetting, potentially across the Scientific Advisory Committee world, then I think that's really concerning. So journalists and others in the world, I encourage you to investigate that. FOI requests should be being made. So, well, we need you back, Fiona. We need another report. No, well, we need you back on this case. You do, I know you've got a lot else on your, <laughs> on your plate. So I did an interview with Times Higher last week, and I, I, think, I think about this, I think, we need, I think scientists need to do a bit more, don't you? You know, I mean, I, you know, we're doing our best, but I think we do need some of the scientific, uh, uh, academic scientific organisations to, to try to have some more leverage. And I, I, I'm, I'm disappointed that they haven't really ste you know, stepped up to that. Well, I just realised I might have slandered Toby Young. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to clarify my comments. He'll get his own back, it's fine. He's, he made comments on Twitter, a Twitter that, expert. that, that were, could be construed as being misogynistic. And I'll take back anything else I said about him. <laughs> And while, we're, and while we're probably putting in some qualifications, and given that we're about to have a general election, although David recommended the Lib Dems and the Green Party, just remember there are other, 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 are other parties that you can vote for. Other, there are other options. Um, I'm conscious this will go online at some point as well. So um, other parties are available, as they say. Uh, now, there's a lady in the middle there, and I think Hi. this is probably... Oh, OK, yeah, we'll take your question as well, then. Um, uh, I'll, be, so I'll be very brief. Um, my name's Kristen. I'm a human rights lawyer. I've been a solicitor in this country for 16 years, so please don't hold my accent against me. Um, but I just wanted to echo some of the comments you made about the impact of drug testing in prison. I work in prisons almost every day, and I've seen in the last 16 years the absolute epidemic of spice damaging prisoners. Prison officers are being assaulted. I don't know why the Prison Officers Association and the government are taking it more seriously because it's actually impacting them not just the prisoners that they actually don't care very much mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to comment very briefly on an experience I had recently. Could you do that? Going Could you be very brief? Very brief. Going yeah, to a young offenders, I went to a young offenders, I went to a young offenders institution representing a very young man who was incarcerated, who was up for parole, and they refused me to bring in his parole dossier because they suggested that I would have imprinted it with spice mm -hmm. and would be giving him spice and therefore violating his Article 6 rights under the Human Rights Act, which we may no longer be subject to very much longer. But they are system systemically, systemically um, breaching people's rights, and they just don't care. Yep, would you, thank you. Would you, you, thank you. Would, you, would you pass that microphone up a couple of levels? There's a lady just above behind. <laughs> and then we'll take your question. Hi, um, sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Um, I don't have any prestige position. I just graduated from King's um, in July um, from doing psychology. And I think like, as a young person, I see like, I feel 
drug use is so much more profound in my generation than I think adults realize and people don't really talk about it and I feel like there's so much damage actually amongst young people that people can't talk about and I guess um, I just want to ask if you're not like let's say a policy maker or like a researcher how could someone who's motivated at this age kind of look into getting into that field or influencing mm -hmm. things potentially? Well, you certainly like follow drug science don't you? Yeah. <laughs> and you follow me on Twitter, yes? Yeah. And you can take part in some of the surveys we do. <laughs> and you can become a, a member of uh, the drug science community, and that's a good way of beginning to sort of get your sort of toes in the water of policy engagement. Okay. Thank you. And there's also a number of other good drugs organisations. I mean, um, Alex mentioned Release, for example, that does yep. some very good mm -hmm. campaigning work in this area. Mm -hmm. So there. Thank, you. I, thank you. Thank you for your contribution. Wow. All right, we'll, t we'll, take, we'll take one more down here then, and then I think we will call it a day and then we'll... Thank you. Hey, um, so thanks, David. Um, I saw you had two graphs, the one, the policy MCDA, I think it was, yes. where you analyzed which sort of type of government or which type of regulate restriction yes. would be best for each drug. You did yeah. it for alcohol and cannabis. Did you yeah. do it for psychedelics or any other no, substance? It, no, it's, they're so complex and difficult to do that we, we did it, we, I mean, it takes a, it certainly, uh, at least half a day to do each one, so we only had funding to do those two. We also did heroin, which came out interestingly similarly that uh, prohibition was worse than state control. We'd like to do it on a lot of other drugs, we just need funding. Because okay. it's, you know, you do, need a, you do need to get together an expert group of about 20 people for at least a day to do it, and that's, that's quite very expensive. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Um, those of us who would like to uh, join us for the reception, it's out, turn left, up the stairs to the next level, and um, we're up there somewhere. But I mean, it's, it's fairly easy to find, I, I, I understand. So, um, so, so do join us. Those who've made a donation uh, towards the cost of the reception, thank you very much. If you haven't, but you would like to, it's not too late. Um, on the postcard that hopefully everyone's got, there is the link to our donate page, so by all means um, put in a quick donation then as well. Uh, and also in the card there's the details about how to keep in touch with our work. Uh, you can sign up for our free e-bulletin or you can fill out your details on the card and just hand it in to any member of staff. Uh, but it just leaves me to see, I, I, the things I take away from that is I'm more at risk of, of water poisoning than cannabis, which is one of the things I love about David is his, his amazing factoids and kind of um, comparisons, uh, which is partly actually what got him into trouble in the first place with his um, comparisons between um, um, ecstasy and horse riding. Um, but that's another story. So th thank you very much, David, for a wonderful presentation. It will be online. <laughs> Thank you also to Alex for your contribution, which was very valued. And thank you to the audience and all your really fantastic questions.